Mary Reckner, grew up back east, but she's long been firmly rooted in the Portland literary community. She taught at PSU, PCC, and the University of Portland. Uh, she's been awarded fellowships from Literary Arts and the Regional Arts and Culture Council. She's read at Portland Book Festival back when it was Wordstock, and at Lagrenaut, Powell's, and Broadway Books, and many others. She worked as director of youth programs at Literary Arts and now teaches at a local high school. While her work has been published far and wide, you can also read it right here in the Oregonian, the Oregon Literary Review, and in Oregon Humanities. It was also a small local press, Propeller, that published Mary's 2010 fiction collection, Nine Simple Patterns for Complicated Women, which Kelly Clark describes as a tight, incisive, and darkly funny series of vignettes about mothers, wives, and the people who unwittingly become them. <laughs> for me, reading this collection is like seeing a friend's bedroom before she's had a chance to tidy up. It's rife with awkward intimacies and small and delicate truths, the silent longings, realized disappointments, and ungraceful desires scattered there are all at once disorientingly familiar and refreshingly exposed. In these stories, Mary lays bare the truth of women's aspirations, that they are plural, yes, often contradictory, yes, stubbornly persistent, and all as essential as water. In her most recent work, The Opposite of Wow, a novella out last fall in the Hong Kong Review, Mary explores what human longing looks like as the last of our innocence is washed away. All three teenage narrators are recently parentless through divorce, death, or emotional distance. With a childhood honesty that is yet theirs, they tell us immediately what they want. Alina confesses her irrational desire for attention from her coach. Adrian knows he needs a male role model, but all I have is my out work dad with a DUI. And Susie openly acknowledges the boundaries she will trample to feel that she still has a mother. Mary throws these kids into the deep end, forcing us to watch helplessly to see if they will sink, cling desperately to something that cannot possibly keep them afloat, or swim bravely away. The opposite of wow is a story that will suck you in. Beneath the surface of the deceptively shallow teenager quips and complaints, the small bad behaviors, the tediousness of a high schooler's day, is a longing so deep it will make your lungs ache and your heart break. Please welcome Mary Rackham. Thank you so much, beautiful. Thanks um, to all the readers. It's just been so amazing to hear everyone's work tonight. And um, thank you for all of you here tonight, friends, family, lovers of literature, football fans. We appreciate you all for being here. Um, the Opposite of Wow is a novella. And I don't know if anybody, I certainly didn't set out to write a novella. It was more like, is this a short story? No. Is this a novel? No. Is this a YA novel? No. Um, and I worked with an editor who talked about how a novella is a great form for um, a story where when something happens, nothing can ever be the same again. And um, this book is about teenagers taking risks and adults breaking the law. And um, it's also, I think, a good fit for, I guess, instead of thirst, I thought of thirsty. And that's how I felt um, as an adolescent, just thirsty for life in, in every way, and experiences good, bad, and usually a bit of both. So this is the beginning of the opposite of wow. Alina, Friday afternoon. This is me, late for practice, jogging toward Coach Thorne. All the cliches click into place. My heart skips a beat. I can barely breathe. I break out in a sweat. It's his shoulders and thighs. It's the stubble on his chin. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Losing my mind is the best part. My irrational response to my volleyball coach makes me feel free. You're late, he snaps, taking a break from yelling at both sides of a six-on-six -six scrimmage. Our high school gym smells like it always does, body odor and talcum powder. You owe me laps. His voice is harsh, but he's grinning. I was with Susie in the locker room, I tell him. She has cramps. Yuck, I should have chosen a cleaner word. She needs ibuprofen. I take a step to one side as if to separate myself from Susie, my best friend. She's Thorne's daughter, also our team manager. She can take care of herself. Thorne glances over to the empty bleachers, where Susie usually sits with her magazine and phone. 
When I left her in the locker room, she was curled on her side. Thorne watches Megan O'Neill dive blue ponytail legs of a colt, throw the ball into the air, and windmill her arm. Girls on the other side of the net bobble the return. The ball bounces out of bounds. Great serve. This lopsided grin is for Megan. Doesn't matter why you're late, he tells me. Go run. I can feel him watching as I jog the edge of the gym. I spent most evenings here this summer, training for the upcoming season. Last year I was on JV, this year I made varsity. My goal was to be starting setter, but that honor went to a freshman, Jackie Miller, who moved to Portland from California right before school started. Jackie's working out in a corner of the gym with a trainer jumping rope, her multiple braids flying out from her head. People are calling her the best setter in the entire state of Oregon. My plan was to play volleyball all four years and get a scholarship to play in college, but I'm barely into my sophomore year and I barely get to play. Being a bench warmer sucks. I run past the first aid kid on the bleachers. What about Susie? I holler when I get close to Thorne. Can I bring your ibuprofen? Run, he yells as I pass him. How many laps? My voice is loud and tinged with sass. Several of my teammates turn to look at me. How many laps do you want? I'm in Thorne's AP US history class too. I may not be the best setter on the team anymore, but I am his best student and I know he knows it. Run, he yells again, hand whipping a circle in the air. I keep running. Susie comes out of the locker room, frizzy blonde hair held back with a headband. She slides across the gym in purple socks. Hey, she says when I go by her. She fumbles through the first aid kit on the bleachers. Did you forget my pain and suffering? She calls after me. An ace bandage rolls across the floor. When I get close enough, I scoop it up and toss it back, but she misses. The bandage bounces away, unwinds. Let's see some hustle, shouts Thorne. We have a tournament on Monday. His voice has this habit of pushing inside my body. Pick up the pace, Alina. I love it when he says my name. He's beautiful and he's tragic. Six months ago, his wife, Susie's mother, jumped off the Burnside Bridge. Fact, three months ago, I had sex with Brian Wong in his mother's minivan. It was as awkward as it sounds, probably because Brian is a boy. Thorne is a man. <laughs> I stop counting laps and chant silently to myself, keep running, keep running, keep running. When I step out of the gym after practice is over, my twin brother Adrian is standing next to the door, hunched shouldered in the rain. Thanks for making me wait. A lit cigarette glows between his fingers. You know I had practice. I dig an elastic from the pocket of my jeans, swirl my damp hair into a messy bun. Smoking on school property is against the law. Want one? Adrian over offers the pack. You know I don't smoke. You know I don't smoke, mimics Adrian. He flicks his butt onto the street. The dark time, Susie calls October in Oregon, from Maybon until winter solstice in December. Recently, she's been calling herself a Wiccan, and though I'm not into the potion and spells, I find myself absorbing the pagan details. I can't stop myself from hoping to see my father's car. Before his new baby arrived, Grigor occasionally surprised Adrian and me by cruising up to the bus stop after school in his Toyota to take us to a Cuban restaurant smelling of cinnamon to share croquetas filled with squash. I hate the baby, I announce. Don't hate the baby, let's get some food. The damn bus is always late. Adrian heads for the plant pantry on the corner. I only have a dollar, I call after him. Don't you need bus fare? I have my bus pass. Then why don't you just go home without me? He ignores me. In the plaid pantry at the shelf of candy, he grabs a Snickers. Let's get what I want since it's my dollar, I tell him. I don't like Snickers. You like Snickers. <coughs> Adrian places a candy bar and two fireballs on the counter. What can I do? I hand over my dollar. Give me a bite. I thought you didn't like Snickers. Adrian already has the wrapper off. I try to pull the candy bar out of his hand, but fail. In the last year, he's gotten stronger than I am. We used to be equal. He's taller now, too. His shoulders broader, his hands and feet bigger. I smack him as hard as I can. Dude, ease up. His mouth is stuffed with chocolate. You ever heard of playing? We get on the bus, five seats. He pulls another Snickers along with a package of rolling papers from the pocket of his sweatshirt. You stole that stuff. I try not to sound shocked. You stole that stuff, you mimic. <laughs> Stop showing off. I grab the new Snickers, unwrap it, and take a huge bite. What's your problem? My mouth is deliciously full of chocolate, caramel, and peanuts. Problem? There's no problem. Adrian begins his tried and true weird boy routine. He leads hard into my shoulder, pushes his face close to mine. You have a zit on your cheekbone, I tell him. He slumps back into his plastic seat, grabs the remainder of the candy bar out of my hand, and stuffs it into his mouth. 
It's a three-day weekend, I remind him, though I have to play in a tournament on Monday. Are you going out tonight? Can't. He rests his head on my shoulder. Aunt Cosmina is flying in. I know that. We're babysitting, remember? Shit, I forgot. Why does Donna get to meet our aunt before we do? Donna's our stepmom. Cosmina's my mother's long-lost sister from Romania. Not really lost, just out of touch, due to the fact that she was my father's girlfriend first. We don't get to meet Cosmina because Donna, before Donna, because we have no power in this family. I thought you figured that out already. See what a freaking pain that baby is? It's not the baby's fault. There's nothing wrong with the baby. I don't see it that way. Grigor and Donna's condo used to smell like sauteed chicken and quick cooked rice. Now it smells like diapers. Adrian and I have been relegated to sharing a room because the baby needs a nursery. Even our bedroom has been contaminated. My pillow smells like baby. So do my sheets. My dad's entire condo is full of baby blankets and baby bottles, baby clothes, and baby bouncy seats. There isn't a chair in the living room without a rattle or a chewy toy wedged under a cushion. Adrian pulls out his phone. Smile. He takes my picture. I'm writing a memoir. Really genius? Didn't anybody tell you writers write? Photographers take pictures? And I have that class too, remember? Everybody in 10th grade has that assignment. Adrian gives me the bird with one hand, and then the other holds out a fireball. Take it. He turns his head to show me the lump in his cheek, and drools a little bit on purpose. <laughs>